Manager, Dick Manager. And Jack Carter. Yeah, um, co-chair of the Friends of the Vermont State House. And Jennifer. Good morning, Representative Burke. My name is Jennifer Fitch, and I am the Acting Commissioner for BGS. And John Dumville. I am from Royalton. I'm co-chair of the Friends of the Vermont State House. And David Sheets, not Linda. Uh, correct. David Sheets, uh, Vermont State Curator. And uh, Rebecca? Uh, Becky Wasserman, Legislative Council. And Senator Benning? Yes, Joe Benning from the Caledonia County District, master of how to turn off and turn on your computer and your Wi-Fi in order to unfreeze yourself and get back on a Zoom meeting. Great. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, and is, is home, would that be Mike Ferrant? I don't know. Um, that might be Mary Leahy, I think. Oh, oh okay. Who's 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 listed as home? Is that you, Mary? Yeah. Um, okay. It, it seems to be. I'm I'm Mary Leahy. I'm um, honorary trustee of the Friends of the State House and chair of the Friends um, Curatorial Task Force. Great. Uh, John Bartholomew. Yes, I'm John Bartholomew. I represent Heartland, Windsor, and West Windsor. Uh, somehow, John Dumville, now people are repeating already. Mike Ferrant. Uh, Mike Ferrant, Director of Legislative Operations, just here to support Janet. Thank you. Uh, and Ruth? Hi, I'm Senator Ruth Hardy from the Addison District. And Vicki? Representative Vicki Strong, and I've served for 10 years in the State House. I live in Albany. And I just wanted to give a shout out to David and thank him for coming to the Alexander Twilight uh, resolution reading. And he did a very nice talk, had a great hat. Um, so that was really pleasant. And, and it was wonderful to have him there. And, and I forgot who was with you from the Friends of the State House. Uh, Tom Slayton. OK, he, yes, he's thank the, you. the vice chair of the Friends. Thank you. Yes. Oh, and it looks like somebody's just joined us. Steve Perkins. Mm. Well, well, wait a minute. Um, I'm Representative Molly Burke of Brattleboro and the chair of this committee and Senator Betting is vice chair. So um, I think I, I sent out an agenda yesterday and we'll need some help from, from Becky, but uh, basically just to sort of review that our, our, the statutory functions of the committee is that we shall be consulted on all activities relating to the acquisition and care of paintings and historic artifacts and furnishings and the refurbishing, renovation, preservation and expansion of the building and its interior and further that the sergeant at arms and the commissioner of buildings and general services shall consider the recommendations of the committee that the committee's recommendations shall be advisory only. Um, so why don't we move from there? Oh, and I, I assume that Sorry, I hear. Sure. Oh, yes, please. That, that was the, that's the statute um, that's still online, but the, what was passed in the Capitol bill amended that. So there are some additional functions. Right, right. Yeah, and that's what I wanted you to talk about. Right, and um, uh, yeah, and I assume everybody's familiar with Zoom and, and maybe we can use the electronic hand, but if you don't know how to do that, just, I think there are enough of us, we're all on one page, so we can see. So then I think David, you're up next to talk about the work of the curatorial task force and how that relates to the Capitol Bill and the Capitol Bill that references the State House Art Collection and the role of the advisory committee. Yes. Um, so for the past um, two years, I believe, 
my office has been working with a volunteer uh, group that we have put together over a period of time, actually, um, chaired by the curatorial committee chair, Mary Leahy, and Mary is with us, uh, and I'm hoping she'll feel um, moved to talk a little bit about the work of the task force. The last two years, um, we, the charge of the task force in, in a nutshell was to connect all Vermonters with their state house, to ensure that all Vermonters felt connected to their state house. And we, uh, it was spurred into creation when our office received a group of objects from the Abenaki people that were given to Governor um, Shumlin during his tenure upon the Abenaki being recognized officially as the indigenous people of Vermont. And we decided that the very first project that we initiated was to discuss with the task force a project to connect the Abenakis to the State House first and foremost. And we did that by creating the exhibit that is currently in the main lobby um, about the recognition of the people of, of the Abenaki people as the indigenous people of Vermont. That, in other words, was a story that we knew would resonate with the State House, since the lobbying to make that happen had occurred in the building itself. And many of the participants in that process uh, were giving us direct testimony to that experience. So we created that exhibit and um, identified other, what might be called marginalized groups of people, um, women uh, among them, although I'm not, sh that, that certainly is not a minority uh, within the state, um, African Americans, and we drew um, some of these people into membership on the curatorial task force, including a number of our natural partners, such as the Vermont Historical Society, the state-owned historic sites, um, the Vermont Arts Council, the Vermont Humanities Council. So all of those are, are people who have been helping us with this process um, and we're still going thanks to the wonderful leadership of Mary, who is particularly passionate about uh, this charge. And uh, Mary, do you wanna say something about the, the task force at this point? Um, thanks, I'd love to. Um, this, this is a group of dedicated volunteers um, who have a variety of skills, both professional and um, and leadership in their own communities, really, really, really dedicated to enlarging the uh, the imagery of the state house to include everyone. Over time, we have realized um, and have begun work on the fact that we needed we needed a, a, a comprehensive interpretive plan and I know we'll get into that more but um, rather than a piecemeal let's add um, this exhibit and, and that exhibit that tells the story of, um, of all peoples in Vermont as they relate to the State House. Um, we needed something overall that has many pieces to it. Um, training for, for volunteers who lead tours, um, the technology aspects of the story to be told that goes well beyond 
um, the, the tour guides and, and the publications and all that kind of thing. To put that together is a piece of work that we're, we're now dedicating ourselves to. And starting um, on the, the first rung of that ladder and, and foundational to all that that follows was a, a recent uh, training in understanding implicit bias, which was led by Curtis Reed, who is a member of the of the task force. Thank Lots you. more I could say, Lots but from, I, I, exactly the, oh. <laughs> the I, I will say that members of the legislature who have also been mem members of the task force, such as Coach Christie um, uh, and others, um, Ruth uh, uh, began to talk to me as soon as she was elected to the legislature about her concerns. We invited her to be a member of the task force. So little by little, we've gotten additional membership, particularly members of the legislature itself who have helped us with our work so far. And I want to express my gratitude to Ruth for uh, taking this another step forward by creating her bill um, to address some of the very concerns that our group was grappling with. And thus, uh, we have buy-in now from the legislature at large which I take as a major charge for our ongoing work. And we're very grateful that all of you uh, passed Ruth's bill into law this past, uh, this past session so that we could um, really grip this responsibly and go forward to develop an interpretive plan such as Mary described. So I wonder if this might be a good time for, for um, uh, Becky to talk about uh, that bill, the Capitol bill. And I also want to, I see that Steve Birkin, Perkins joined us late. Do you want to introduce yourself? Sorry. Not a problem. For some reason, my internet decided to go out right at 9 o'clock. Um, it kind of yeah. came back on at 9.07, so here I am. But um, I'm the executive director of the Vermont Historical Society. Great. Thanks for joining us. Okay, so Rebecca, do you want to talk about the the actual bill and how that sure. intersects with the curatorial task force? Um, if it would it be helpful if I put the language on the screen? Yes. Let's see. Okay. Oh, uh, actually, I think Janet has to allow me to do that. Um, well, I'll just, I'll talk through it, and if I can show it, I will. Um, so, uh, the language does a couple things. First, it amends uh, what's in statute for the functions of the Legislative um, Advisory Committee on the State House, um, which is what uh, Representative Burke was just um, referencing. Um, so, it does change the amount of times during the year that the committee um, meets. Um, and it also says that alleged council has to provide assistance to the committee. Um, and then in terms of the functions of the committee, it adds some additional um, duties. So uh, the committee um, uh, has to develop a plan for the acquisition or commission of artwork for the state house collection that represents Vermont's diverse people in history including diversity of gender, race, ethnicity, sexuality, and disability status. Um, the next thing the bill does is create in session law, so this is not the green books, um, this, uh, this state house artwork and portrait project. So um, it sets out some intent about um, how the state house uh, artwork and portrait collection should be expanded and, and what it should represent. 
and um, the policy of the, the General Assembly with respect to the State House art collection. If you'd like me to read any of that, I can. I don't, I don't know that I've. Oh, I can share it now. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you, Janet. Is that, uh, can everyone see that? Can you make it a little bigger, Becky? Does anyone know how I could do that? <laughs> I think if you press, if you click on the plus sign, I think that makes it bigger up in the top bar. There's a plus, a minus. Oh. Yeah, there you go. Okay, there we go. Does that work? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so here's uh, section 32 of the Capitol bill, which um, has the session law on the portrait project. Um, so here's the intent section that I was referencing in subsection A um, to expand the state house artwork and portrait collection. And that should be um, to represent diverse stories of those who have significantly contributed to Vermont's history. Um, the intent is also to give special consideration to the State House as a place of employment for a diverse workforce and as an institution of public education for students and members of the general public. And then finally, um, the that the state have a policy of including diverse leadership stories that reflect all of Vermont's history when acquiring or commissioning artistic representations for the art collection. Um, subsection B is the policy for the uh, that that the art house the state house art collection should reflect. Um, so first is uh, it should reflect those who have served as leaders and have significantly contributed to the history of Vermont. Next is those whose service relates to the state or the Abenaki Nation, the civil rights of Vermonters, the legislative process, or the operation of the state house. Third is stories of significance to a community, a tribe, or historical moments that demonstrate the diverse nature of Vermont's people and history. And then finally, um, a policy with respect to the natural landscapes and environmental features of the state of Vermont. Subsection C is um, developing the plan. So the committee in consultation with the state curator shall develop this plan for keeping in mind, um, incorporating the intent and the policies that I just uh, talked about. Um, subsection D is recommendations. Uh, the committee um, will make recommendations, um, research and recommend significant historical Vermont leadership stories that warrant uh, inclusion in the art collection using those in intent and policies. And part of that recommendation process um, is in consultation with the public and relevant experts, including um, Vermont historians, artists, and diverse community leaders. And then finally, in March of next year, a report is due to the House Committee on Corrections and Institutions and the Senate Committee on Institutions with this plan that the committee develops and the recommendations um, that they have. And then uh, finally, the language in the Capitol Bill also amends, so we're going back to statute again, the statutory um, uh, section that deals with the develop the state curator's position. Um, so there um, is some additional language in that section that creates some um, additional responsibilities for the state curator. Subsection C is um, an acquisition policy. And so the curator uh, would do this in coordination with the Legislative Advisory Committee on the State House um, and in accordance with this plan that the, the committee is, um, is tasked with developing. Um, so the curator, curator will adopt an acquisition policy that ensures um, that the acquisition of art for the State House reflects a diversity of artistic media and artists the natural history of the state and the diversity of the people and stories of Vermont throughout the history of the state. Uh, and then the uh, state curator also has to uh, create an interpretive plan. And this plan um, is actually done in coordination with the Friends of the Vermont State House and the Vermont Historical Society. 
and the plan tells the story of the state house art collection through accessible written multimedia and oral means and includes appropriate and inclusive training of state house volunteers and staff. And that is it. Are there any questions on that? I'm just gonna stop the share. So <laughs> Thank you, Betsy. Um, so I guess that brings up a lot of questions about how we proceed. Uh, and I know, um, so maybe this might be a good time to talk about it. And then we can hear from Senator Hardy about the sort of the process of her, her bill. And then uh, David and Janet want to talk about sort of an overall picture. So does anybody want to, David, well, maybe you have thoughts about how yeah. we as a committee work with you um, to, uh, to, to accomplish this task. Yes. Wait, Molly, Molly, Representative Burke? Yeah. Could, uh, this is Ruth. Uh, could I just, before David goes into how to implement it, maybe give a little backstory sure. on how we got to this part and then. Yeah. I wasn't sure what, which would fit where, but that's fine, sure. You, okay. You go, and then David. Okay. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think this will dovetail into what Dave, what I'm suspecting David will say. But um, <laughs> um, so first of all, thank you all for being here. And this makes me super excited and really proud to get to this point. Um, uh, the the actual idea for this bill started over a decade ago when I visited the state house with my daughter's fourth grade class, um, and noticed that nearly all of the portraits in the state house are of older white men, and I was there with a you know fourth grade class that was more than half girls, including my own daughter, and. Um, I at that time spoke to then Governor um, Douglas, who is a friend of mine and whose great niece was in the fourth grade class who we brought to the state house and said, what is going on with all these portraits? We need to diversify the portraits. And so that was my very first conversation um, about the portraits in the state house. And then as I visited more and more over the years, um, especially with groups of women who were eager to run for le the legislature in my previous job, um, it just became really clear that the, the portraits in the state house didn't represent um, our state, the people of our state. Um, and I was at the time specifically looking at it from the perspective of gender, but it's, it's as stark, if not more stark from the perspective of race and other mm -hmm representation. So um, really, really over the years, having a number of conversations with um, women in the legislature and their thoughts about it. And so when, as David mentioned, as soon as I was elected to the Senate, I went and talked to him in January of 2019 and said, we really, what can I do to help you do something about this? Because then I was spending all of my time in the state house. Um, and it feels strange that we passed this during a legislative session when none of us were in the state house, but, um, uh, and, and talking to other women in the legislature and people of color and also people who work in the state house, whether they're staff for the legislature or advocates and lobbyists who are there every day or people who visit and also lots of conversations with the pages, um, just talking about the portraiture in the state house. Um, and so I talked with David and he, at that time, a few weeks after I talked to him, and it may have been coincidence, but um, <laughs> he created the curatorial task force and started working on uh, that, the, the process that, we, that he described earlier. And um, the, um, because the portraiture is the primary art form in the state house, one of the, the bill started as a bill about portraiture um, and trying to diversify the portraits in the state house. Um, and I did work with the legislative, the curatorial task force on a lot of the language and then Senator Benning can talk about some of the changes that his committee made to the language, but, um, and I worked with, Becky was the drafter of this language, um, 
But the concept of leadership stories um, came out of conversations with the curatorial task force, um, particularly um, members of the Abenaki community talking about how leadership in the Abenaki, the Abenaki nation is different than in, um, you know, in sort of dominant white America. Um, so talking more about stories of leadership than necessarily individual leaders. Um, uh, so that is one of the reasons that that is in there. And then talking, uh, disability status was added as um, um, along the way because a lot of people talked uh, about wanting to represent people who had different struggles, maybe physical or um, other struggles to get to the position of leadership. Um, and um, the, the, the other thing is I consulted with a lot of artists, including um, coincidentally the artist who painted Governor Douglas' portrait in the State House, Kate Gridley, who just emailed me this morning about, uh, about this work. Um, and uh, she wanted to make sure, and other artists wanted to make sure that there was a re diversity of artists represented too. So it's not just about who the paintings are of, but who paints the paintings who are in the State House. Um, so that was another consideration. Um, and so after I created the language, I worked also with a curator at Middlebury College. She was teaching a class on cura curatorial form and her students actually worked on the bill and then came and testified on the bill. Um, so that was uh, a fun thing um, to, to, from the perspective of students who are learning to be, be curators and why it matters to them and how, what their ideas are. Um, and uh, I heard from so many women in the State House and people of color who are in the State House about how meaningful this is to make sure that there is true representation. And while I really appreciate the, the two displays that are in the lobby, they in, in some ways feel more like tokenism than true representation in the State House. So I'm really hoping this will move forward into full-fledged rethinking of how we represent um, our state's history and the people in the State House. Um, and to David's point about having the full legislature behind this, um, one of the barriers that I heard him talk about a number of times was the whole concept of quote unquote, who deserves to be on the state house walls and that it's traditionally just been governors or mostly governors. And so having the full legislature back this, um, this language, really underscores the fact that that doesn't have to be the case. And in fact, the legislature itself believes that it should have a broader representation of Vermonters in the state house, not just former governors. So hopefully this will provide um, David with the, the cover or how, whatever you wanna say, to be able to make much more radical changes in the, the artwork at the state house. Um, and yes. I, just thrilled that it passed and that we're all here today to move forward on it. And hopefully when we get back to the state house in person, we'll have a plan and potentially even some artwork in the works to be able to hang at the state house. So thanks everyone. And I'm happy to answer questions. And maybe if there aren't any questions, Senator Benning, do you wanna to add to that um, in terms of your committee? Um, let me back up a little bit and say that as a history nut who was first exposed to the State House back in the 70s, um, I understand that that building is a working museum and it's one of the places that I really every single day I walk into it, uh, thank my lucky stars for being able to be there. The building itself has given all of us the opportunity to talk about Vermont history in a way that um, every Vermonter can feel proud about and feel part of. For me, when this bill first came to our committee, it's like a lot of other bills that come to a committee. You, you realize you have so much time 
and you had to make choices about what bills get brought through the committee process. It might just have been coincidence, but I was walking down the hall as a fourth grade class was coming down the stairs. And there were two girls that were uh, talking to each other about how cool the building was. And specifically, they got to the term, the pictures on the wall, their language. And one said, these pictures are so really cool. And the other one said, yeah, but they're all men. And for me, that moment was like, you know, there, there is something to this that a stodgy old white guy like myself um, has just gone through time with a privilege and recognized that this is a change um, that I've never even thought about because I've just accepted what is there. So I kind of got determined to work on this bill and get it passed. And the bill that you now see here in the Capitol bill, the language has changed some, but I think it's for the better that we broaden the potential for all segments of Vermont society to become part of this process. And I tell my, my stodgy old white guy friends who think this is all just a bunch of, of craziness, this is an opportunity for us to expand our own knowledge of Vermont's history. It's always been there. There are segments of society that have always contributed to the process, but we have just never taken the time to be cognizant of those entities and try to work them in around us. So I don't look at this as a threat to anything. I look at it as an opportunity for us to expand the picture of what Vermont is and actually improve on our own knowledge of Vermont history. So it was fun. Um, I had a great time working with a lot of the people that are on the screen right now. And I really do hope uh, going forward that we see some things that uh, broaden our knowledge. I, I heard Ruth use the term tokenism with respect to the two displays at the bottom of the stairs. That's a word I've learned myself recently, having read Leila Saad's Me and White Supremacy, along with several other things that I could incorporate into this discussion, but I won't. The uh, upshot is, though, that I agree with Ruth that those displays, they are wonderful, but they are similar to what should be happening all throughout the building. There are many empty spaces in the building that we can take a look at. And as the building is a working museum, some of the portraits may come down in order to accommodate, but any museum has a rotating display of the items that is in any museum's possession. And I think that keeps the State House refreshed for people to come as fourth graders and see something and then come back again as eighth graders or in high school and see something completely different. That's okay. It's not a threat to Vermont history. It is in fact an opportunity for us to expand our own horizons. So thanks for the opportunity. And uh, John Dumville, I'm gonna close with a, a statement to you. I actually got to quote Graham Newell on the floor last week again, uh, much to some of my colleagues chagrin, but Graham was actually quoting Reed Lefebvre. Some of you may have heard that name before as one of the most flamboyant legislators. I think today we would have called him bombastic, um, but he wrote some beautiful words about the State House a very long time ago, and I closed out my little speech as minority leader on the floor, and John, I thought you would get a kick out of it most of all. Thanks. Uh, Mary, if, I'm sorry, Thanks. Molly, I was going to, yeah. If I could just follow up with uh, what uh, what was said so eloquently by um, the senator, we um, I started, and I need to say this because uh, Dick Mazza is perhaps the only one on the screen right now who goes back far enough to remember the state house of nearly forty years ago. Um, that was not yet restored. And the, the 
the back in those days the the friends of the state house grew out of a project that i was blessed to work on as a research assistant and back then the m word was what we kept referring to the state house as being something we felt that it was but we dared not utter the M word. The word was museum. Because legislators at that time were not accepting that that's what the State House was about. It was their workplace, first and foremost. And it was not particularly a 19th century building on the inside. So the restoration was accomplished over decades of help very active help from the friends of the state house and little by little we've managed to conquer uh the m word is now very much in sync with the overall appreciation of the state house today and it is an incredible gift to another stodgy old white man to be able to enter an era when no one is doubting the State House is a museum any longer. And in fact, all of you have truly embraced that role, which is a major challenge for us, I, I hasten to add. Um, the, the type of museum that the Senator is invoking and Senator Hardy as well is a very active museum that might need, I'll, I'll just warn you right now, a staff that is larger than two people to worry about it as a museum. But I also hasten to add that our partners, our longtime partners in uh, developing the stories of all Vermonters and the history and the scholarship of our state. Uh, that's the Vermont Historical Society, two doors down the street. And I think we're going to have to, among our charges in this uh, plan, try to understand what they do and what we do. And that is the exciting work of this process. We need to understand what the State House and the stories the State House should tell are, and what do we leave to the Vermont Historical Society to explain to the public in their museum. So happily, Steve is part of this team, and his staff has been part of our curatorial task force as well, and we're gonna be going forward with conversations in both groups as we try to discern where to draw certain lines, how to create the interpretive plan, basically, that um, is suggested in this document. That's gonna be exciting work, and I'm very um, grateful that I have the opportunity to do this before my career closes out. Uh, I think Senator Hardy has her hand up. Do you have your hand up? Yes, I do. <laughs> but, but actually, Mary, I think Mary Leahy had her hand up before you. She had oh. her, her, her real hand up. So let's let Mary go first, okay? Thank you, thank you. Um, this is one of the, the um, points, a, a, a major point that we've been um, deliberating on the curatorial task force, um, distinguishing the the role of the state house and the state house's museum versus the um, the role of the Vermont Historical Society and meeting after meeting uh, um, the Victoria Hughes from the Historical Society has been a wonderful contributor. Also distinguishing um, what the State House is versus or, or alongside of Vermont Historic Sites, the Arts Council, all these 
um, folks have been working together to uh, let's let's look at this small building that means so much to so many um, legislators who work there, the staff who works there, the 150,000 visitors that come, the school groups. Um, what exactly is is the state house in the in the mix of the rich life of Vermont? Talking about that, I I think has has enriched the uh, all of us and and the work of our partner organizations too. But that's the kind of thing that the interpretive plan will help to make clear. Um, as as we go forward in in changing the imagery and and believe me that the state house I I've been uh, not officially there but constantly there since since I was able to walk um, my my family lived just down the road my down the street my father was a printer his children delivered printing to the state house at least weekly. So seeing things change there and not change there um, has, has made up the fabric of my life. Great, thank you for those comments. Um, Senator Hardy. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to underscore two things that both David and Mary mentioned and, and Senator Benning a little bit, um, that the, the State House has multiple um, purposes. And um, one of the things that um, was important to me that be in the bill, um, and you can see it under the section about the report, is to give special consideration to the State House as a place of employment for a diverse workforce and as an institution of public education for students and members of the general public. Um, and in part because that's obviously true and it's also a museum and it's also a historical building and it's so many, so many things then those all need to balance appropriately. Um, and uh, I didn't actually fully um, appreciate the building as a place of work until I worked there and was there every day. Um, and I know that there are many, many staff members who've been there for years as their place of employment um, and um, trying to make sure that we don't forget that that th that is also true. Um, and as we've, several of us have mentioned, the students who come through and the members of the public. Um, and I also just wanted to underscore the interpretive plan that's also been mentioned. That was, that's actually a change in the permanent statutes um, to ensure that this interpretive plan that is um, done, that is under the responsibilities of the curator um, and a lot of that is is uh oh it says my internet connection is unstable can you guys hear me because it says my internet connection is unstable can you hear me yeah. yes yes hear me we hear you you may not be hearing us Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I'll try to continue. Just, just really quickly, um, the interpretive plan has come up for a number of reasons, um, but one that I think it could be helpful in addressing is over time, as there are people in his, history who, who are more is discovered about them and they become controversial figures. And the example I'll use actually is Governor Percival Clement, who was the governor that um, blocked the um, vote on the ratification of the 19th Amendment in Vermont. His portrait hangs in the State House in room 10. And I think it would be really helpful and appropriate to have something about who Percival Clement was and what he actually did and um, the historical time in which he lived and the, the role he played in Vermont history. I, for one, think it was a hugely negative role, an embarrassing role, a horrific role, but it's part of our history and being honest about our history and what, what his role of it in it was, I think is really important, not to just hang his portrait and assume that we honor him 
um, but to to really understand the history of our state and the, and the, the good, bad, and the ugly about the history of our state um, as a good example. And there are other, there are other governors um, who were involved in the eugenics movement or who did other, other things that were not so great. Or there were, there's apparently a governor whose portrait hangs in the, um, the governor's office in the state house that um, had a disability but his, um, he had a paralyzed arm or something, but his portrait doesn't show that, but really talking about um, his story um, could be really interesting too. So um, I'm really looking forward to the interpretive plan and think it's a huge part of this. So I'm grateful to Mary and her committee's efforts to get this going. So I, I'm wondering probably the, all of us are wondering, David, how do we how do we move forward with yeah. this? So with I our stat statutory responsibility and uh, work with the curatorial task force. So if you could. So let me. There is a document that I sent Becky and Janet. Can you put that document up for me, Janet or Becky, on interpretive planning? Yeah, just one second. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Becky. Thank you. So what I'm about to show you is a process that we hope to uh, develop in the coming year. And that process is already underway to some extent. Um, can you enlarge that a little? Um, Okay. Is that too big or is that okay? Everybody, can you read that pretty well? Um, it's uh, so a good interpretive plan is basically a document that outlines a process and that process uh, is developed here. I'm going to go past the preliminary could you advance it up a little bit higher? Yeah. Um, it, uh, it describes, so basically an interpretive plan consists of the bullets. They don't have bullets, but the, this paragraph right there. So the interpretive plan must be based on scholarship about the site and about the newest museum scholarship on interpretation. It provides a conceptual framework and describes the site and its significance. It identifies major interpretive themes that identify and organize the important stories to be told. It identifies and describes target audiences that the historic site intends to reach. It proposes methods for implementation. How will the information be conveyed to the various audiences? And it proposes methods of evaluating the success of the interpretive planning and how changes can be made over time. So I think it's entirely appropriate that as Ruth suggested, the planning itself is now part of the state curator's responsibilities in statute going forward. Because this is a process that all museums go through periodically. It sets up a plan that is good for perhaps something like 10 years going forward. But as we have already all, all of us who are students of history know, through time, history constantly is revised. And the stories that are told um, change. And the stories that come to the fore are discovered anew. And we're going through a major period of such change in the United States right now. And I know that my colleagues at the Vermont Historical Society, at the Shelburne Museum, 
all museums basically are going through a period of reflection and a period of discovery um, to bring to the fore new storytelling that has been left out of the narrative of our country. Um, this past year, I've been reading uh, Jill Lepore's uh, wonderful history of the United States, a uh, really great tome that I recommend to the entire group. And as the curatorial task force has discussed and the friends of the state house have discussed, um, we've been doing a lot of reading over the last several months, um, reading in fact that I would not have time for were it not happily for the pandemic. This is one of the upsides of the pandemic is that it is frankly giving my office a breather from worrying about the day-to-day -day operation of the State House as a public museum. And we're looking forward to embracing this process through the rest of the year uh, to create something that frankly, I wouldn't have had time to do were it not for what we're going through. So that's one of the upsides of, of what we're experiencing. And we, in consultation, as I said before, with the state-owned historic sites, the historical society, and others, um, will hopefully uh, create this plan. Um, your group, though, is no, not going to be simply a group that we bring up to date. Um, I want the Legislative Advisory Committee very much to be at the heart of this process. So we may have to meet with a little more frequency than what the committee is used to. Um, and I hope you're okay with that. Um, we're gonna need you as major stakeholders um, to be available for walks around the State House, possibly on site, um, socially distanced and masked, but I think we have to remind ourselves um, possibly of the building itself in this process over and over again. We need to examine the current storytelling that is going on. Um, I Just a show of hands very quickly, how many of you have a copy of Intimate Grandeur, the, uh, the book that we wrote back in 2015. So one of the things I've asked the Friends of the State House to do and the task force to come um, is that I would love everyone to pick up their Intimate Grandeur and reread it um, with a, a lens that is all about trying to discern what the narrative, what in the narrative is appropriate and what in the narrative do we not, not think is as appropriate and what are the stories that are currently missing. And that, if you could make notes as you reread Intimate Grandeur, that's kind of a good place to start because that is the story, frankly, that our tour guides are telling visitors. That is the story that the audio tour that visitors access from the Sergeant at Arms office. That is the story that they're being told. It's basically the story of the building itself. And it does not venture very far from the narrative of what the State House is all about. But as you can see a little further in what um, this page in front of you uh, lists, it's also a place where conversations about democracy, conversations about gender and race, uh, conversations about the many issues that have been brought to the State House over and over again, as Ruth suggests, 
um, you know, the role that Percival Clement played in the story of the 19th Amendment and whether Vermont would become the state that put that amendment over. Unfortunately, he denied uh, Vermont that privilege and it went to Tennessee to become the state that put the 19th Amendment over. And um, that's part of the story that we tell in The Staircase um, about women and how they have gained power very, very slowly over the past uh, 200 years of Vermont's existence. So these are the stories that definitely resonate in the State House. We're telling those stories currently, but we need to know more about what you think of those stories and where we should be going with our interpretive planning process. What's also exciting, and I'm sure that Steve Perkins would agree with this, are the different ways that we now tell stories. Not just books, not just exhibits, not just works of art. Um, we have digital means of storytelling. And one of the ways that we're going to hopefully identify are how visitors can access the storytelling with their devices when they are on site. So the delivery of information is very much a key part of what we hope to develop as part of the interpretive plan. And not only delivering that information, but identifying how different audiences need different approaches. Um, for example, people with disabilities. How are we making it possible for people with disabilities to access the information when they're visiting the State House as visitors, um, in addition to what Ruth uh, suggested about um, identifying that population, connecting that population to their State House? Um, so we have all kinds of different ways of looking at things a little more complicated than a mere museum. And that's part of our challenge, is to further define what the State House should be in all of its complexity, and then moving forward um, on the front to try to identify how we, how we accomplish that over a period of years um, and evaluate that going forward. How is it succeeding? How is it not succeeding? And what should we be doing? David, do you have a, a recommendation for um, when this committee uh, ought to meet again? I, I do. Um, November is a good month for, I think, you to reconvene after the election after a certain thing, a number of things are behind you. I know that a number of you are, um, are probably gonna be moving full steam ahead uh, with your campaigns right now. Um, by then, our hope is we will have a consultant on board. So the other great thing about Ruth's bill is that it enables me to access money that is in the capital bill for planning purposes. And we, we plan to use that money to pay a consultant to help guide this process through the remainder of the year. March may be a little hard to uh, wrap up the entire interpretive plan, but it is a time certainly when we can report back to the newly reconfigured committee at that point. So in other words, I expect to meet with your committee as it is currently composed again in November. We can even decide at that point whether we want a meeting before the next legislature convenes in January. And then after January, we'll hopefully uh, have a newly reappointed committee 
that um, we'll continue to work with uh, up until March. And it's a little hard for me to know right now where we'll be in the, in the month of March, um, but I've been told that a really good interpretive plan can easily take a year to develop, especially if you have aspects of it that require reaching out to the public repeatedly to try to get more feedback from the stakeholders, the, the, the potential audiences um, in terms of trying to develop um, strategies to uh, bring it about. So that could take more time than, um, than you would suspect, but uh, clearly March is something we're gonna be working feverishly to try to uh, meet that deadline, if at all possible. Okay. Does that um, sound appropriate? Uh, coming back in November, possibly in December as well, if we think that there are steps identified at that point that um, might uh, be good to bring you back. Fine, that's good. Uh, thank you. So I know that um, I, I'm aware of time and people's time constraints. I know David, you had wanted to talk a little bit about the um, sort of the overall job of this committee as a, as a watchdog um, for the restoration, you know, an update on efforts to keep the restoration intact and strengthen the committee's role. But maybe that's part of this process. I mean, do you feel like you want to say something about that now or um, do we- No, we, I don't think thing? we have to get into this too much, but Janet and I have had a number of conversations over the course of the past year um, about the different plans um, for space utilization. Now, of course, the pandemic is causing other um, uh, not permanent changes, but I, I wanted to hear from Senator Benning and others who have been uh, part of the uh, groups that have discussed uh, changes to the interior of the state house and where where you actually think that's at at this point is that the signal for a an answer um do you <laughs> i mean the traditionally this is the committee that i i am hoping sees as part of its charge that it's the ultimate authority over any significant changes to the interior of the state house, the exterior of the state house for that matter, um, that this is a committee that has membership from both bodies in addition to outside groups who have an interest in preserving the state house. So for its long-term preservation, I think I want uh, to know how you all feel about that, uh, of, of looking to this committee as the, the ultimate authority to approve significant change. Let me start, David, by saying there is a new entity called the Joint Legislative Management Committee, which has been um, operating for about a year now. Right. I suspect that conversation will have to uh, take into account that committee because that committee is probably the ultimate arbiter of do we go back into session uh, in the building or do we go back in some hybrid fashion. Um, once major changes are going to be talked about, and I'll, I'll give one little example. Uh, Senator Starr has been very anxious to move out of the closet that he has for a committee room. And it's a legitimate discussion that we are having that he needs to have that change. Um, there have been conversations about where to put him. They have gone from uh, possibly room one, or is it room two, Janet, you have room two. 
um, and possibly moving into legislative uh, lounge in some fashion, possibly moving into the coat room in some fashion. That conversation has not come to fruition just yet. I think my institutions committee in the Senate would prefer that the coat room be modified somehow, but we haven't got the answers to that question. When that question is looking for resolution, I am sure this committee should be involved in the discussion, but I suspect strongly the Joint Legislative Management Committee will be the ultimate arbiter of how that comes to play. I would suspect and I would argue very strongly that this committee should be uh, making the decisions long term based on what kind of uh, portraiture, for instance, that we're having. Those things that will be uh, much longer than just the brick and mortar conversation about what changes are made to the building. So as a member of the Joint Legislative Management Committee, uh, trust me that I will be arguing very strongly for this group to take priority over those kinds of conversations. Hope that answers your question. Yes. Um, I, I guess uh, I would hope that a group, then I, I, if that is a committee that can deal with preservation versus other, can, other, tension, other things that are in tension with it, um, that would be my only concern. I know that this is the committee that saw the entire restoration through to fruition. And it has not been as active in recent years. Happily, the statutory changes that we made a couple years ago, I think are going to ensure that this committee meets with a little more frequency and um, therefore could possibly be a little more active in that watchdog uh, role. And I think uh, some of us just don't know where the authority is anymore. It's a little difficult to know. But as we talk about the State House as a museum, for example, the legislative uh, functions that take place happily at a time of the year when the museum functions are not as uh, uh, in full you know, flower in a normal year, um, meaning the front lobby, the location of the sergeant at arms, the location of a gift shop, the location of tours, all of these things are things we're used to doing in the off season. And um, part of my worry is that that function does not come to legislative lips in meetings very often and it isn't being weighed with the same concern um, that legislative functions might be. So I just want to make sure those uh, concerns are brought into the right forum for discussion if, there's in, if they are in tension with some of the legislative functions. I appreciate that, David, and I have, I have two suggestions. The first is that uh, this committee should meet a little more often to make sure its presence is constantly in the face of those joint legislative management committee members who do walk about the building from time to time. Um, the other part of that is Senator Mazza and I are both on that committee right now. Um, I'm not going to speak for him, but I'm certainly going to make sure that the committee is well versed in the fact that this group has a very long history uh, from the days when I first walked into the building and there was a solid green carpet in the state Senate um, to where we are now and make sure they understand this group will long transcend any existence of the Joint Legislative Management Committee. Because I suspect that once we get through COVID-19, and the short-term decisions like where shall Bobby Starr's Agricultural Committee meet, um, we probably will no longer exist as a committee. This group, however, will be here for, well, let me say in the words of Reed Lefebvre, 
<laughs> this is from 1968, by the way. History tells us that this house has stood here for 110 years. Its golden dome, its granite walls, its hallowed corridors may well be here a hundred more. Only the members will change. The duties will remain the same. New generations will come to take our place. New generations dedicated as we are to a holy cause, the service of our people. In this group's case, making sure that building is still in existence a long way down the road from now. The Joint Legislative Management Committee won't be around when that happens. Thank you, Joe. That's, it is very comforting to hear you say this. And I also um, want to add that Reed Lefebvre's portrait, did you know that we have a portrait of Reed Lefebvre, oil on canvas? Did not uh, know that. It hangs in my office. It, uh, I'll share the image of it with the committee when we send out the minutes. It's, it's a hoot, meaning the reason it's in my office <clears throat> is that uh, it attracted undue attention to itself in the State House. And uh, it's a wonderful portrait, actually, and I love it, which is why it's there rather than in storage. So uh, I, I, did, I did tell the Senate the other day about the uh, farmer's night when he came in and, and displayed his circus. Indeed. And uh, his classic his, picture. Uh, the, his portrait includes the circus in the oh, background. Good. It's quite, quite a wonderful piece. Anyway. I know of what you speak, and I concur. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Senator Hardy, did you have your hand up? I did. Thank you, Molly. Um, I, I just, I, this is sort of going back to um, what David was talking about, about the plan and the timeline and the meetings. Um, one thing just really quickly, and I'm sure you've thought of this, David, but also looking at what other state houses are doing in the country, because I know that there are many state houses that are sort of in this kind of process as well um, and have multiple um, purposes just like ours does. And I, I, I like New Mexico and New Hampshire are two that, that I know of who are actively working on this same issue. And then the second thing is in the legislation, I just wanted to point out that there are actually two plans that are mentioned. There's the interpretive plan and then there's the plan for the acquisition and commission of artwork. Right. And that specifically is the plan that this committee is supposed to um, report on in uh, on March 1st. Um, so uh, they're obviously linked, um, but making sure right. that, that acquisition and, and commission is part of that so that we can get more diverse portraits and artwork in the State House. And I was really thrilled to hear that you were able to access funding and for planning. Mm -hmm. um, and part of what needs to be reported on March 1st is what are the budgetary needs, especially given the situation we're in with finances. It's going to be a real tough sell, but being honest about what the cost may be, I think is important. So that's just quickly what I wanted to say. Thanks. Sure. The plan that you're talking about, yes, is a distinctly different plan, and that is the accessions plan, the, uh, which is a plan that the State House currently has. So happily, we have such a document. We have already been using it through the decades, and it's a matter of looking at it with fresh eyes and revising it. So we won't be starting from scratch when it comes to an accessions plan for the State House. Um, but we will very definitely be revising it. Um, so I, the other thing I wanted to mention is that just uh, within the month, the Friends of the State House have tackled our first uh, potential accession um, coming up, and that is a portrait of Alexander Twilight for the State House. Um, they also were planning to have a fund drive to raise the money and were able to get one donor to take responsibility for what we potentially believe will be a $30,000 portrait um, for the State House. So they're, they're 
setting up a small committee to oversee the process of getting an RFP out to um, portrait artists such as Kate Gridley and others um, to do this portrait for the State House. National Life Group is the donor. Thanks to Chris Graff, longtime State House uh, journalist and now Vice President of National Life, Chris and his wife Nancy, who is on our board at the Friends of the State House, um, took this very wonderful step to uh, give us the money to go forward with that plan. So that portrait will be in development in the upcoming months, happily. Can I raise my hand? I don't know where the raise the hand function is. I apologize. I'm new to Zoom. Um, I think the funding piece is really important and I just wanted folks to, to understand how it works. So David's program is inside fee for space. Our fee for space program is basically how we pay for state owned buildings. And then obviously um, David can leverage capital bill um, when he works with leadership at BGS and, and, and sort of we figure out what that leveraging looks like. But I just want folks to know that David does not have his own budget necessarily. And so if we are talking about future expenditures that may hit, let's just say BGS at large, my preference would be to actually ask for a line item in the capital bill. So that's probably another year or two down the road, but I'm just letting you all know that like we don't have money at BGS. And so if we're going to spend money on art, which I think is a great thing to do, we just can't, we can't put it on the back of fee for space to do that. That's helpful. And Okay. She's my boss, by the way. That's my boss. <laughs> and I'm very much in support, so I don't want people to feel like I'm not. It's just when we talk about funding, we just have to be really strategic in how we do that. And she has a Southern Vermont connection, too. So, uh, so um, do we, is there anything else that we need to discuss at this time? I, I think probably, uh, David, you could sort of let me know when you think it would be uh, time to have another meeting and then mm -hmm. I could send out a, a, a doodle poll. Oh, Janet has something to say. Thank you, Molly. Uh, I just wanna add one thing that we are going forward with our mitigation processes in the state house for the COVID-19. So we'll, beginning, we'll be beginning to remove some things out of the state house to allow for social distancing and to work on uh, different things that we'll be trying to do in January once the legislature makes up their mind of how they want to work, whether it be hybrid. But we know that they're not going to be able to be in the state house in the full capacity that they are now. So we won't be making any major changes to uh, to the building, of course, and I've spoken with David about a lot of this. Uh, we will be taking the coat room, room nine, and turning that into a committee room right now, but just so uh, that no one worries that we'll be knocking walls out or anything like that. So that's the plan, and I just wanted people in this committee to be aware of that. So well, we still have lockers. <laughs> you still what? Well, we still have lockers. No, you won't. <laughs> You're going to have to bring your backpack or something. All your belongings have got to be on you. I was stored a lot of shoes there. I know. Hopefully that change is going to be with the Senate committee, not a House committee. <laughs> no comment, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay. So, um, is anybody, are there any other questions? you think maybe it's time to adjourn for now and uh, very interesting conversation and very exciting. Anybody have anything else they want to say? John Bartholomew. I was just curious, many museums around the country have worked out plans to reopen with very strict guidelines and spacing. Do we have, um, wh what are we thinking in terms of getting the building back open as a museum? Maybe that's so not a short answer, but. <laughs> Yeah. Hopefully it is. Uh, hi, John. Uh, just quickly, we have not gone down that road yet. We were trying to get through the legislative session for now. Uh, we would definitely have to be doing some social distancing. Now that we're, our full foliage is about over, I'm not sure we'll open back up right now 
because this is usually when we're, this is our slowest time of year anyway, and we're going to be doing a lot of work within the state house, moving stuff. Uh, but then again, I think that at some point I need to have a conversation with leadership to see what direction they'd like to go about that. Um, unlike John, other museums, and I'm fully aware of this, we do not rely on earned income uh, to keep the state house going, right? So we are, we don't have the same urgency that many of my colleagues have to get their doors open as soon as possible. We have that luxury. Okay, uh, Mary. Oh, well, I just want to um, accept that the friends of the state house not having been um, able to run the gift shop this season that that is a, a funding negative for us and and of course our funds are are that we gain either through fundraising activities or the, and the gift shop are then directed entirely towards the state house itself so we, we have suffered some loss in funding. Understood. Uh, anybody else? Okay, thank you everybody for a very great discussion and uh, we will reconvene in November. Thanks everybody. Really thank you. you. Thanks, Thank Janet you. For, bye. And thanks, Becky, bye. for being on. Okay. Bye bye.